three weeks into the new year. I hope that whatever new resolutions that you have started, for some of you, it might be committing to more meditation sessions. I just hope that you will continue throughout the year, or even better, throughout your entire lifetime. Because practice in itself is what can help us the most. How we apply Zen or how we apply the Dharma, the teachings into our day-to-day lives. Sitting meditation is very good. I commend everyone for being diligent in your sitting practice. And what's next after sitting? This is something that we always emphasize about, which is how do you continue your meditation outside of the meditation cushion, outside of this Wednesday circus? No doubt we come here to get a reset, to learn from one another, to reflect deeper into ourselves. That's why we're here. That's why we're sitting. At the same time, we also want to be aware of why we're actually coming here. Or why are we setting out on our goals? We want to achieve something. Perhaps success or happiness, stuff like this. Outside in the world, it's very important for us to have goals. And also ideas of the rewards that we can get after we overcome a certain situation or when we achieve what we want. And it all leads to a sense of liberation, right? To be away from a situation, to be removed from a certain situation, for situations to improve, that it is supposed to give us a sense of ease and liberation. To get what you want, what you have been working towards, so that you can relax, so that you can smile, that's also a sense of ease. But there's also a saying that the only Zen and peace you find a mountain is the one that you bring it with you. As you can see, when we come into a session, into meditation, we bring different kinds of energies and residual mental feelings and thought processes that we might be able to detect in our bodies or simply our energy levels. And mindfulness with self-compassion, loving kindness is what can help us to envelop ourselves. So to be here, And now, it's very important for us to understand what it really means. It has been used very generically. Be here and now, be here and now. And a lot of people emphasize on the now. But they forgot to emphasize on the here. Whatever, Whatever situation you find yourself in, you are there in that moment. You could be encountering certain workplace politics or... For example, I'm sitting here right now, I'm perspiring like mad. I'm very hot. So I can't wish to be sitting across the hall over there where Chen is sitting, where the aircon is the strongest. Right? So we now, we're now, right? Now I'm hot, but now you're cold. Because you're sitting there, I'm sitting here. And if I desire to go there, it's impossible. Can I go there? I can't. I just can't because of the circumstances that put me here in this position that I'm in. And I have to learn to acknowledge, yes, I'm feeling hot. I will wish for the aircon to become colder. I will wish to go there, but I can't. But why do I want to go there? Because it's supposed to bring me a sense of ease and relief. And you see, it's internal, right? These feelings. To feel irritated by the heat, to feel uncomfortable due to the heat, or to feel a sense of ease. It's all inside. So in our lives, sometimes we can perceive problems as something big, something huge, but they are all external. External things, we can't do that much to improve them or to even control them. But what we can really work on is internal, of how we're feeling, what kind of feelings we have, to recognize them and to use our lo- not just our loving kindness, but also our wisdom to apply the Dharma, to apply the principles of meditation, to look inwards, to learn to accept things, and to coexist with things. So when we talk about certain goals that we have, some people, when they start on a spiritual journey, they also have certain desires, different goals. So society has taught us that, yes, we need to be goal-oriented, da, 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 blah, blah, blah. But when it comes to Dharma practice, it is that the goal becomes a cause of your action. Because we say that there's no separation between self and other, There's also no separation between causality, which is cause and effect. You come to this session because you have a hope to gain something. Even if you think that you're coming with an empty mind, there's still 
kind of desire that propelled you to stay in this session. So you see, our goals are driving factors, motivational factors to push us to do something. And that's about all. Because without goals, we won't move. Without desires, we won't move. But what is important is that for us to understand that there's a difference between thinking and doing. When you thought about a goal, you plan how to get to a temper, how to log onto Zoom, or you plan to achieve what you want to achieve in your work, in your relationships, in your health. That came from thinking. And it was right to have that thinking, that thought process. But the moment you have started moving, that's the time to do. And to do, it means not to think unnecessarily. Which also means not to be overly focused on the goal itself. Because when you think about the goal, you see, you're thinking again. You're not being present. The goal might be something in the future, which you know is subject to change. Following so far? So when we talk about being here now, it's very important for us to understand whatever you have thought about doing, you're already in the process of doing it, of accomplishing it. And I believe that you have also anticipated the setbacks, the trade-offs, and the problems and obstacles that might occur. So that kind of thinking, that kind of contemplation is important to be prepared for any things that you have anticipated, but not to be hyper-focused on it as well. Because when you anticipated it, it might happen, it might not happen, at least you are prepared. But when it has not happened yet, that is it. What should we do? How are we bringing our sense of being into those moments when problems are not occurring? We're not meant to be uptight, right? Like, oh, no, I need to be very careful. If not, this thing will happen, that thing will happen. So there's a difference between being cautious and being mindful. Because mindfulness is supposed to bring us a sense of ease, a sense of calm, a steadiness. There is a saying in India, and I believe we might have read it somewhere on social media, which is that if there's a problem that you can change, then why worry about it? Why stress over it? Or when you know that it will eventually change because of the laws of impermanence. The certain obstacles we have it is just a phase and you have done whatever you could, then why stress over it when you've done your part and you know that it will eventually resolve itself? It could take days, weeks, months, years, but you know it's going to resolve. So why stress and why think about it compulsively, obsessively? And even know that there's things that you can't control at all, then why stress over it? Because we are stressing over it change anything. So the Buddha mentioned about dukkha, which is mental suffering. You can translate it as stress, anxiety, certain depressive states, when you lament about things, when you feel a sense of despair, that is mental suffering. But to put it easily is that dukkha is the opposite of well-being. So how can you preserve your well-being as a practitioner? That is very important for us to introspect when dukkha is arising and when is there no dukkha arising. So when there is no mental stability, that is dukkha because the mind is being affected. It can throw you into all kinds of thinking, all kinds of behaviors, and all kinds of emotions. So it's very important for us to be mindful of our mental activities and whether there's any dukkha within us at all. So like I said earlier, when there are things that you can't control, why obsess over it? Because obsessing over it creates more suffering. And when there's suffering, there's dukkha, you know that there's a lack of mindfulness. And when there's a lack of mindfulness, there's a lack of wisdom, lack of clarity, lack of stability and lack of your own energy, basically. The energy is being thrown outside of you. So problems can actually persist longer when we get obsessed over it and we allow our minds to be affected by them. So when you talk about here and now, which is right here and right now, where am I? What can I do? How can I be? It's very simple. 
because when you ask yourself what can you do you're also asking yourself what can you not do which means what should you not be doing and what should you not be thinking about and that is how we can cultivate our minds how we can apply the dharma into our day to day activities not just on the meditation cushion but in everything that we encounter when I was first ordained back then when I was a monk some of my teacher's friends they have been monks for decades they always told me one thing they said be careful of your heart or your mind in the eastern traditions and in our linguistics there's no difference between heart and mind it's the same thing in Pali it's called chitta so be careful of the mind it can trick you very easily it can create fears it can just change the course of your life just like that so they said one thing, don't trust your mind or don't trust your heart. That's why in Zen they say no mind, no one to sabotage you, no you to sabotage you, no you to stand in the way of peace, loving kindness, joy, compassion. And therefore, we need to always be very mindful of where the mind is going, which direction is it going. Is it obsessing over problems until it causes mental suffering? which is the lack of mental stability, the lack of solidity, the lack of firmness. And that is all we need to do in our practice. Whether we practice different kind of sadhanas, tantras, or various forms of meditation, ultimately it just leads to where is the mind dwelling in? Is it here? Is it now? You see, when we stop obsessing over problems and obstacles in our lives and when mental suffering doesn't get in, you really have a sense of liberation and ease because you're not grasping anymore. And like the Buddha said, our grasping is what can cause us suffering. And we need to learn how to let loose, loosen it a bit, bit by bit. Then you have a sense of ease, you have a sense of joy. And that's where we can fully focus on the here and now. What is deserving of your attention. Things are meant to bring you joy and happiness in this moment. There's actually many things, like the lack of a toothache. Your shin might be hurting, but your knees are not hurting, you see? You just have to change your attention. Then there's joy right there. Right? It's raining outside, but you're sheltered here. Oh, it's nice. You're learning to master the mind. It's like uh, the mind, when it's not mindful, it can be like a wild horse. It just dashes across the forest. There was a Zen saying that there was a man in the forest and then another guy was on a horse riding, charging straight into the forest. So the first guy asked the guy on the horse, he said, where are you going? And the man on the horse replied, I don't know, ask the horse. So as practitioners, and knowing that you're devoted your life. And why I say your life? Because life can only exist in the present moment. So right here and now you're here listening to this discourse. You are dedicating your life to practice. To taking charge. To not allow your mind to guide you. But for you to guide your mind. Just like the horse and the rider. You are the rider. So you see a lot of things in our life. Fears, sense of loss, or even self-sabotaging. It's all occurring in the mind. Peace, happiness, excitement, it's also in the mind. Anger, it's also in the mind. So in actual fact, when we are experiencing mental suffering, dukkha, the place of work is not outside of us. It's not in the situation that you believe causes problems, but it's within ourselves. That's the place of work. Of how can we be mindful? How can we have compassion and understanding? And that's about all. It's very simple. For us just to come back and understand this. I was just talking to someone. someone